We can get down within about 10 centimeters, but it's not just the X and Y coordinates. We can also, because of the angle, get the Z coordinate, right? So we're really able to detect a position in space in, in three dimensions. We've, we've already got it deployed at over 30 million square feet in the retail space. Um, so it's out there, it's being heavily used, we're getting feedback, and we're expanding the number of use cases. IoT has gained the mind share. Like if you, I, there, there have been a number of recent studies done with CEOs, and it's something like 90% of them expect to do major IoT projects in the next five years. But then you ask them, you know, how many of them have a, a strategy in place and a, and a budget that's lined up that can support that, and, it, and the number is reversed. Uh, most recently, we acquired a company called DG Logic, handles all the communication to different kinds of endpoints, different protocols, and brings all that information into a common bus. You're listening to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Beaker System with Steve Stadler. Welcome to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Beaker System. My name is Steve Statler of Statler Consulting Inc. Uh, and uh, this week we're going to be talking about visual light communication with Greg Carter, who is the general manager of the IoT business uh, for Acuity. So, Greg, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, Steve. This is, uh, I think this is very cool. So in the book, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Beaker System, we talk about this toolkit approach to designing solutions. And I think it's a mistake to look for the perfect tool that's gonna do everything. And really you need to have the right tool for the right job. And so we had a lot of fun looking at lots of different interesting technologies and visual light communication, I think is really, really cool, quite disruptive. and. Uh, I first saw it when I worked at Qualcomm. I have to say, I thought it was like fixed. I thought this, nothing can be this accurate. It was really quite a, an eye-opening thing. And I'm sure you have a lot of fun demonstrating um, that technology because it's so accurate. And so we're, uh, so my goal for this session talking with you is to give people a bit of a, a bootstrap tutorial on what VLC is and how it fits in with uh, Bluetooth technology, which I know you, you also have that, that as part of your uh, uh, portfolio, uh, and, and really just discuss what is it that people can do with VLC. Um, okay, we've got accuracy, what can we do? How does it work? What can it do? What can it not do? And then it would be great to talk strategically about what you're doing at Acuity. You came from Cisco, you're deep into IoT. What's a lighting company doing in the Internet of Things? I think that would be really interesting. And, and I have a personal belief that it's the infrastructure providers that are going to drive this niche market into mass market adoption. Because uh, So I think you guys have a special role to play. So I'd love to hear your take on that and your perspective. But... Um, Maybe um, we could start off with you just um, telling us a little bit about what your role is at uh, Acuity. Sure. Yeah, so um, as you said, I, I came from Cisco. I, I, I uh, was there for about 13 years, uh, the last five of which I was running the, uh, the IoT services business for them, which was the professional services business that had to figure out how to take all of these new emerging technologies and stitch them together to, to solve a customer's business problem. So it was a, it was a great place to cut my teeth and, uh, and really learn what are the opportunities, but then what are the real significant challenges that are facing this industry as we, as we begin to evolve into the IoT space. Um, so, so anyway, I was there, I did that for, uh, for about five years. And then I, what attracted me to come over to Acuity was um, you know, some of the key challenges that we were running into at Cisco, uh, you know, as we, the first step in any kind of IoT project was to, you know, be able to connect to the devices. You needed to have some source of data to be able to do something with. Um, then you had to be able to manage all that data, you know, and, and in the world of IoT, you know, it's, it's 10 to 100 times, you know, the number of endpoints that we're talking about with the whole rest of the Internet combined. Mm -hmm. So massive amounts of data um, that can't all just be dragged up into the cloud uh, and processed. Right. You have to think about a distributed computing network. So lots of, of complexity in how we uh, reach the devices and then how we process the data. Um, and so when, when I came to uh, started talking to Acuity, uh, I was impressed with the fact that lighting um, provides you with a last mile network that is ubiquitous. I mean, anywhere where there's people uh, and there's devices, there's lights. And not only are there lights, but there it's a dense grid. Um, and so lots of nodes 
where you can do both compute and where you can put in radios and other access technologies to gather data from a whole variety of, of different sources. So, you know, I, I, like you, I don't believe that there is a one size fits all single answer to everything in IoT. I think it's it's the very complexity and variability of the, the environment that makes it exciting. And it does mean we need to have multiple tools in our toolkit. But using the lighting networks, indoor and outdoor, and, and actually the entire building system networks as an access technology where you can install compute and sensors um, and, and wireless access to other kinds of, of sensor data in the environment is certainly one of the tools that we should be exploiting a whole lot more than we have been uh, traditionally as an industry. So I was really impressed with it, and uh, and that made me decide to come over. And so now for Acuity... Um, I'm, you know, Acuity has some incredible technology assets, um, a, a lot of really good experience that's been garnered over the last several years in experimenting in this space. Um, and so I was brought on to organize that, uh, to get us focused on a, on a clear go to market and a, and a product strategy for IOT, um, and then to, to build and, and grow this, this new business. And so, uh, we're well on the way now. Very good. And we'll look in, we'll talk about that more in detail. Just uh, for people that don't know Acuity, because the, the, the other guys have kind of a consumer brand that may be um, higher in people's mind, but you guys are a large company, $2.7 billion of revenue, five U.S. manufacturing plants, which makes you green, less kind of shipping stuff around the world. Um, you've got 10,000 employees. So, so you guys are big, the biggest in terms of North American market. I think that's, that's fair to say. Um, so just to let people know that let's uh, let's we'll get back to the kind of relative position of what you're doing and and maybe one last thing to say about your company that struck me is you have very deliberately made acquisition so you've invested a lot in this market this isn't some skunk works let's have a few R&D people mess around with a few things you've hired some pretty uh, experienced people and you've bought some companies and so this is this is going to be interesting but let's explain to people what visual light communication is. Can you give us kind of a basic tutorial in terms of what it does, how it works? Sure, sure. So, I mean, at its heart, uh, we're talking about being able to communicate something through through light waves, right? Um, and in the in the context that we're using it, what what the common um, uh, use of the term VLC. Uh, is it can be confused with things like Li-Fi and other other uh, technologies that uh, various companies are experimenting with that are all about high you know uh, data rate uh, transfer of, of uh, information over light. This is a simpler um, example of that, where, where we're basically getting uh, individual light fixtures to broadcast a, uh, a unique identifier uh, that that uh, by modulating using our our drivers to modulate uh, the the light. Uh, we're able to to basically do a repetitive ID, uh, just like a lot of other beacon technologies. Um, and so uh, then you can pick that up with smartphones, uh, with basically the optical device, the camera on a smartphone, and decode that unique identifier. Uh, but not just the identifier, we can also uh, de detect the angle that the light comes in, uh, in three dimensions. So we talked er earlier about the fact that lighting provides this very dense sensor grid. Um, well, this is a perfect example of that. You, you've got a, a very dense pattern of lights, all projecting unique identifiers. And so then um, we can use the smartphone processing capability to decode the individual uh, signals it gets and then triangulate to get very accurate positioning. Well, I'm, uh, over the weekend, I started this book about Galileo. And so this is basically using Galileo mapping the stars in the sky to navigate around, isn't it? You know where, oh, that's light A, that's light B, just like you're looking for the North Star. And then you can use some basic trigonometry and, and you can get pretty accurate. How accurate can we expect to get with VLC in terms of... We can get it down within about 10 centimeters. Um, and, the, and the other thing that's really unique about it is it's not just... The, the example you gave of Galileo is a good one, but it's not just the X and Y coordinates. We can also, because of the angle, get the Z coordinate, right? So we're really able to detect a position in space in, in three dimensions. Uh, and you can imagine, you know, there, everybody immediately thinks about mapping use cases uh, because people are very familiar with using their, their cell phones outside with, you know, with Google Maps and things like that. Uh, but now you can start thinking about... Uh, First of all, doing that in an indoor environment, uh, but then adding a third dimension to it, which which gives you a whole big range of possible possible use cases. And and you also have orientation, don't you? So Correct. you can actually, I can literally use my phone to 
point, so it's not just a point in, in space, it really uh, is a lot more than that. Um, what kind of, why would I need something that accurate? It's funny because, you know, you, you, you work in the area of Bluetooth and you're always getting beaten up about, oh, is that really how accurate it is? It would be nice if it was more accurate. When you have something, when do you need 10 centimeters of accuracy? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of examples, um, and I think we're going to see more and more once the capability's out there and it's being widely adopted. Um, you know, I, I think the ones that we know about today are um, where we need to, to get a position of someone, say, on a manufacturing line. Uh, we have a, There's a lot of manufacturers that do contract manufacturing for multiple different customers, um, and they would like to be able to know uh, where their workers are standing along the manufacturing line so they can start doing cost-based accounting, right? And so we've looked at some of those use cases. Um, actually, I've been looking at them for years, uh, and because the technology was not quite accurate enough, uh, they were not able to, to to do that kind of analysis. And so now that we're down to about 10 centimeters, we can really get to a station uh, along a manufacturing line. Um, examples in retail, um, you know, any, any kind of a store that has densely packed shelves, um, where you want to be able to help somebody to find a product, um, you know, it's it's one thing if it's very large uh, products. Maybe you don't need quite that level of accuracy, but when you get into shelves, uh, say in a drugstore uh, with lots of different products, and you can imagine being guided in within a couple meters, well, there, there could be hundreds and hundreds of products there that you're having to sort through. So getting much more pinpipe, uh, pinpoint accuracy uh, in the location like that is really, really helpful. Yeah, I so want that application. The number of times I go and I ask for a particular variation of something I've been told I need to get, and you're just like staring at this sea of products. And so it's, you know, getting that X, Y, Z would really, really be helpful. A uh, lot less frustrating. Uh, it seems like that's a, that's a, that's a huge win. Um, so uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about um, where, where you are seeing the the traction is this uh, and what stage are you in the development is this a uh, working product it is it is and so and th this is actually you know, one of the things that we're really proud of at acuity that you know it's we've moved way beyond that sort of skunk works uh, you know r d phase into commercial viable product right which um we've we've already got it deployed at over 30 million square feet in the retail space um, so it's out there, it's being heavily used, we're getting feedback, and we're expanding the number of use cases uh, that, that our customers are getting value out of. Um, so retail is the, is the place where we've got our uh, initial uh, traction, but we're also uh, working in commercial office, uh, in airports, and there's several other verticals that we're in the uh, evaluation stage at right now. So it's it's out there, um, and it's, you know, you, you asked about, you know, where, where is it in its maturity curve? Um, it's also not just a technology at this point. It's baked into a full end-to-end -end solution, right, which in includes the algorithms uh, that we're using with our drivers, the decoding mechanisms. We've got a full uh, software development toolkit uh, for mobile devices that allows not just us but our customers and our partners to build really interesting solutions that can leverage this position data. Um, so we have we have the, the and, and we have cloud uh, analytics capabilities that are based on this, right? So it's really a, a full end-to-end -end system that's now been been proven in the market. Very good. Let's come back to that stack because I want to dig into that a little bit more. But um, let's be candid about what the limitations are of this technology as well. I mean, it sounds like basically Bluetooth shouldn't exist now because we've got this thing that's much more accurate. But it's that's yeah. I, I see it as more complementary. What are some of the limitations that people need? Yeah, to do? I, I think you're exactly right. It is complementary, and that's really the best way to look at it. Um, you know, the the probably the first limitation, the most obvious limitation, is the fact that it is it is a visible light uh, communication path, right? So it's it's got to be line of sight, and uh, and you can't impede uh, the the light getting to the camera, right? So for if your camera's in your pocket. Uh, then VLC doesn't work, right? So, so there's there are definitely times and places to use it, um, but we also think that that can be a bit of an advantage for it, right? So, the time that you really want to be engaging um, your your user community in highly accurate positioning is oftentimes when they're looking at an app and interfacing with an app, and you can be you can be passing them data and and having a two way communication with them. So, um, it's not a passive technology; it's something to be used in very active use cases. Right. Um, so it can also be an that, advantage. That means, so presumably, you have to have the app in the foreground. It's not just it's, it's not just it's out of your pocket. You've got to have the app running. If it's yeah, it has to, to be running right yeah. to be able to be decoding it. So, so it is it is an active technology. Um, 
But another advantage of, of that same limitation is that uh, it can be a very secure technology yeah. right? because unlike RF uh, technologies that pass through walls and ceilings and floors, this is something that gets contained. Um, so there, we're also discussing with a lot of customers that have, have uh, large security concerns that this can be a much better option for them for positioning within their spaces. That, I mean, that is a really good point. And I know from uh, early days of doing location in conferences, like conferences, you have, uh, it's a great place for location technology. You can find your friends and get information about the symposium that you're the particular lecture in. But these walls are thin. And so from, from, from a Bluetooth perspective, you have all sorts of challenges. And we were talking to the guys at Gimbal the other day and they were talking about one of the challenges you have to deal with beacons is just getting the right floor because the signals can bleed through. Exactly. So you solve those. You don't have any of those problems. Exactly. And very complementary with Bluetooth because obviously Bluetooth can s start triggering apps um, in the background and basically get you to a position where the app can be in the foreground. If only you had some Bluetooth technology. <laughs> well, that was a nice softball. Um, yeah, so we, we do take a, a, a two beacon approach uh, to positioning, right? So in, uh, in our fixtures, in our luminaires, we're, uh, we're putting both the visible light communication in our drivers, but also uh, BLE uh, radios uh, for beaconing. And we really see those two things being complementary. Um, in the BLE space, um, for, first of all, by putting it in light fixtures, again, getting back to that, you know, this is a very dense network and a dense grid. Uh, we don't have nearly the challenges of needing to do fingerprinting um, of, a, of a BLE uh, network that uh, battery-powered beacons uh, that are more sparsely populated have, right? And every time you reconfigure your space, the, the RF characteristics change, and, and you've got to remap them and re-fingerprint them. In, in our situation, we've got so many beacons that are covering the space that uh, we don't, we're not, we're not as, uh, as fragile uh, to, to changes in the environment. We also can use the two together to do our commissioning. Uh, our, our VLC is, is a great tool with a simple app uh, for us to go and commission the system to be able to, you know, once it's been installed, to be able to figure out where all those lights are, to be able to map the unique IDs to uh, the BLE and the VLC beacons. Um, and then the, the BLE is, allows us to do in-pocket uh, location detection. So we can do some more of the the, uh, the less granular uh, positioning uh, use cases and the analytics with the BLE. And then as we bring somebody into an area where they really need to be actively engaged and they need higher accuracy, uh, that's when the VLC can take over. And, th and this is uh, when I mentioned earlier that we have an end-to-end -end stack, uh, being able to incorporate both types of beaconing into a single uh, software application that can seamlessly switch between the two is, is a real advantage. And so you have an API that you offer developers, presumably, to, to, to get to this? Is that Correct. And, and if I'm a developer, I want to try this out, what's the best way of getting a hold of that? Well, at this point, we're just getting our developer ecosystem started. So, um, you know, we're, we're not yet at the point where we've, we've got it out posted and anybody can just go download it. It's really something we want to be actively engaged with the developers uh, to for two reasons. One is that we really want to understand what they're doing so that we can continue to evolve our platform and make more and more features available. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, you know, this is a new technology. Customers are just figuring it out. Uh, there's a lot involved in commissioning a space. Um, and so we need to be able to work with our developers to make sure that they know the best ways to use the APIs and to make sure that we're providing the right value to customers. Because the worst thing that can happen to this whole industry is that, you know, people get overly excited and go out and try to solve problems that are really not the right fit for the technology and, and turn customers off. Right. So we want to make sure we, we uh, keep some tight control. So basically, my uh, my business unit uh, has has the uh, architect and engineering resources to help developers uh, to use our, our SDK. And we've got a business development group that's that's uh, all about fostering those relationships and, and ensuring that, uh, that, that people can go out and experiment with the platform. So are you reaching out to folks or how does it work? How do these partnerships happen or is it just being driven through? projects through um... uh, it's it's a little bit of both we we our business development team is going out and looking for um we're looking for partners technology partners that have complementary technologies complementing applic applications um so that's one one way that we uh, we connect sort of more outbound um, we are also getting paired up with uh, technology companies uh, by our customers. So as we go into a customer environment uh, where they may already be using several different apps and different tools, uh, they may have preferred developers, and so we end up getting paired up with them that way. 
and then more and more, we're, we're trying to get the word out. Um, you know, this is this was very much a grassroots effort uh, several years ago. And now, you know, as I've come on board, it, we're, we're trying to get it organized and, and uh, really get the word out to the, to the wider market of what we're doing, uh, as well as, as how to get in touch with us, how to participate in the developer ecosystem. So over the course of the next year, you're going to be hearing a lot more about us, hopefully, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the media. And say a few more words about the acquisitions that you've made to build this stack, because I think that's been quite, that's been a sign that you guys are serious. Right, right. Yeah, so um, Acuity Brands has had a, a long history of acquisitions. I mean, this is, you know, you, you mentioned at the beginning of the show, many people don't know Acuity Brands uh, as a company name, and that's because, as the name implies, uh, we operate under our brands, right? So there's been a whole series of acquisitions in the traditional lighting space uh, to put together a, a really strong portfolio of, of lighting companies. And then after that, uh, began expanding into lighting control companies. Uh, and then more recently into um, into other segments of the, the related businesses like uh, building management. So we acquired in the last year a company called Distech, uh, which is a HVAC building management controls company. Uh, and that was really with the attempt to start combining a, a lot of these capabilities across uh, the building environment to get a, a unified building and a whole series of applications that can be built on top of that. Um, but that also gave us a really uh, great asset, uh, which is a, con a, a unified control platform, right, to be used both for HVAC and for lighting, as well as it now becomes an, a compute node uh, where we can run a lot of our, our applications in the IoT space. Um, so that was that was the, the first one I'd call out. Um, the second one was a company called ByteLight. Um, and ByteLight uh, was, for those who, who uh, work in this space, I'm sure are familiar with ByteLight, they were one of the early pioneers in, uh, in indoor positioning uh, and in using specifically BLE, uh, but they also did quite a bit with VLC. Um, so we brought them in really to, to get, get us started with the technology that we built into our platform for, uh, for beaconing. Um, we then uh, acquired a company called Geometry, uh, which is uh, geospatial. So now you start looking at the analytics and the cloud-based uh, and mobile uh, applications that can take advantage of this, uh, all of this uh, indoor positioning technology. And so this has given us the geospatial analytics and a lot of the visualiz visualization tools that are now available through our APIs. Um, and then uh, most recently, we acquired a company called DG Logic, um, And this one we're really excited about, uh, the newest uh, member of our, of our family. Um, and they brought us two things. One is um, a really scalable IoT platform, um, so a, a, a IoT middleware platform that handles all the communication to different kinds of endpoints, different protocols, and brings all that information into a common bus. Um, so that's that's the first thing it does. It also provides a solution development environment uh, that makes it very easy for non-developers to take widgets that represent uh, connectivity to different kinds of de uh, data types, different devices, whether it's a luminaire, HVAC control, a manufacturing device, uh, you name it, um, and be able to drop those into a, into a solution and then build out a whole set of visualization widgets, gauges, dials, video screens, et cetera, um, to rapidly build IoT applications. Um, and this is, this is a technology that, uh, that's been out there for a while. I was using it when I was at Cisco. Um, it's embedded in a lot of uh, a lot of the big IT players uh, platforms uh, to be able to do that last mile data management uh, to to the devices they're connecting to. So that now really handles all of the data uh, manipulation and the visualization that we're using in our applications and is allowing us to move much, much faster in this space. I mean, you um, earlier gave a very impressive number. Was it 30 million? I can't remember. It was a big yeah. number in terms of the square footage. Um, where, can you slice that by some other dimensions? And uh, I'm, I'm sensing, I, I've always thought that this is going to be one of these things that takes a while because um, I was struck in dealing with, um, with brands, with retailers, that they want technology to be ubiquitous before they start running programs out. And I'm assuming lighting takes a while to, 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 to become ubiquitous. It's going to take a while before every Walmart has got LED lighting. Um, can you talk a little bit about that dynamic, why people are, how are you managing that and what's the motivation for retailers to make this switch from right. legacy systems to new systems? Because that's going to tell us a little bit about the timing of when this is going to hit. And that's what VCs and CEOs of startups need to think about when they're figuring, where, where should I be spending my time and money? 
Absolutely. So I think um, you're absolutely right. In this, this IoT space, there are so many things that have to converge uh, before the mass market will adopt. Um, so we are still very much in the early stage of the adoption curve, uh, where we've got early adopters that are testing these new technologies out, because the investments can be really significant. And it's not just lighting and inner positioning. Um, if, if you're a manufacturer and you want to start uh, collecting data from all of your, your uh, robots and, and your or process control systems, and connect that up with supply chain, the amount of infrastructure you've got to put in place uh, in terms of the network that's going to connect to that, the compute nodes, um, the software, building you know unique software applications that are going to be able to analyze and manage that data, it's a daunting proposition. Um, and I've seen many, many big customers that are they're trying to dip their toes in the water, but you can't really test the, the power of it until you, until you really uh, deploy it widely, even at a single customer. So um, it is a challenge for the industry, but I, I think it's also one of the reasons I'm so excited to be at Acuity Brands, because um, with uh, the conversion from analog to, to LED lighting, uh, the payback is so quick on these projects, regardless of, of any of the IoT benefits, just the energy savings uh, that pays back the initial installation, that we can afford to, to deploy additional IoT technology on these projects for very little incremental cost and it really doesn't change the, the payback schedule in any significant way. So there's this big uh, impetus for, for customers to, to, to go down this road. And what we're seeing now is that these are the same customers that are, that are toying with a lot of advanced um, IoT capabilities for their core businesses, right? So um, outside of the facilities group, you've got the, the groups that run marketing, that run customer intimacy, that run operations, uh, employee productivity, et cetera. And they're trying to figure out their strategy for how to deploy these solutions. And when they find out that they already had a refresh schedule plan, now it may have been five years from now that they were going to be refreshing their lights, but if they can look at the, the payback on that and now see all the other benefits they're going to get by putting this infrastructure in place, it allows them to accelerate uh, their planned refreshes. So I think what we're going to see in this space within IoT is these lighting-based IoT networks are going to roll out very rapidly, um, and they're going to become ubiquitous uh, just because the, the the economics make sense. Yeah, that's that's a great situation for you guys. You don't have to make these very strategic arguments about IoT, which a lot of uh, CEOs of retailers will not really have heard of, you can just make the case that, look, you're going to just save a lot of money, which is, which is exactly. pretty much everyone can understand. And, and I will say that I think, um, I think the IOT has gained the mind share. Like if you, I, there, there've been a number of recent studies done with CEOs and it's something like 90% of them expect to do major IOT projects in the next five years. But then you ask them, you know, how many of them have a, a strategy in place and a, and a budget that's lined up that can support that? And, it, and the number is reversed. You know, it's it's 10 or 15 percent. So and that's because these are such complex projects. Uh, cities is another great example where we see this, where um, smart cities, you know, are that's capturing mayors all over the world. It's capturing their attention. And everybody wants to do smart traffic solutions, smart parking, um, smart garbage collection. There's a whole range of different uh, use cases. But each of those benefits a different city department, right? And any one of those departments does not have the budget to put in a streetlight infrastructure or, a, or some other kind of network infrastructure throughout a city that is the, you know, the, 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 the tracks that have to be laid before you can start rolling these solutions out on top of it. So again, by taking advantage of the, the LED conversion, we can in many cases fund the initial infrastructure that has to go in place that allows an, a, an organization that has a divided budget to now start rolling software solutions on top of that at very small incremental cost. So I, I really think this is going to be the key that unlocks this sort of innovation. And I am so this is starting to sound like it's easy, and I'm assuming that it isn't easy. Mm. Um, and I feel like is it true to say that people can buy a new lighting system without this sort of Bluetooth mesh piece and so forth? So Absolutely. it sounds like you, I'm assuming you've still got a sales job to say, yeah, don't just have light for light, one light fixture for another light fixture. Here's what you can do if you join it up. And if that's the case, uh, what kind of conversion rate are you seeing? Is it like um, uh, a minority of people that are going and having the deluxe version or uh, what? Conversion, are you seeing? 
I would say we're probably still a little new to draw, you know, good statistics. Okay. Um, but I, but I can tell you anecdotally, um, once we get into a discussion uh, that goes beyond just the facility uh, manager who's typically making a purchase of a, of a lighting um, system, uh, our hit rate is very high, right? Because the, the first of all, again, the economics support it. Uh, it doesn't change the payback in a significant way. And the potential is enormous, right? And we now have, have some good data on, on the customer benefits uh, that they're receiving from, from using IoT solutions on top of these networks. Um, but the, the hard work is, frankly, you know, the culture, cultural challenges, uh, how to bring all of the different parties to the table who, uh, who will benefit from this solution. Because the typical buying cycle for lighting, right, is, is it goes to a specific organization within, uh, within a customer. And... The, the sellers, the electrical contractors, the architects, uh, they're used to doing things a certain way. And so we're having to sort of break that model and bring more people into the conversation. And that's really where the challenge is. It's not so once you get everybody to the table, it's not hard to, to make the right decision. Nobody wants to be the guy who says, well, we uh, we just put in place a, a, a lighting infrastructure that's going to last 10 to 20 years. And we decided not to make it smart. Right. I mean, that's just not going to happen. But but getting all those people at the table so they can make the right decision and they're armed with the right information. That's the challenge for the industry right now. And who is it that's helping you make that strategic argument? Are you do you have like strategy people on staff or are you working with you know, McKinsey and folks like that? Or? Right. No, we're, we're doing it in house. Uh, we do have strategy people on staff. Um, we have strategy folks. We have business development folks who are out educating both the acuity sales force, but also the, you know, our wider agency networks, um, the largest uh, architecture and design firms uh, about, you know, what, what they should be thinking about as they're as they're putting specs together for these kinds of projects for us or for, for our competitors. Um, so we're doing a big push um, of education. Uh, so that's that's a big part of our investment is around business development. Um, but yeah, the, the strategy we're doing in house. Very good. Well, it sounds like you've got a really fun job there. Some great technology, uh, really cutting edge. And uh, and I, from your perspective, you're working in an environment where this is the future. It's you know the business is not going to be replacing these tungsten bulbs that are blowing uh, every uh, six months or, or one year. The future is your your sort of revenue streams around services and so forth, I'm assuming. Is that fair to say? That, that's absolutely true. I mean, it, it, the whole industry is moving to LED uh, and it's moving rapidly. So, uh, but that also, it, it creates a great opportunity, creates a great funding source, um, but it also puts some pressure on us because uh, these LED uh, uh, fixtures last so much longer than, uh, than the, the analog ones did that um, if you miss the window, you know, for a given customer, the refresh cycle is very long, right? So we have to make sure that we educate the market uh, about the, the potential and, and what they need to think about uh, when they're putting this, these kinds of systems in so that they can take advantage of this from years to come. It's really a future-proof strategy. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think one of the, you clearly have big company, great customer list, incredible position, really interesting technology. So what could possibly go wrong? And if I look at large companies trying to, move to a quite a different market. One of the biggest issues is alignment. Um, and the great thing for you is, you know, the industry is effectively burning the boats behind you. There's no going back to the tungsten bulb replacement business. Right. It has to be forward. And I have noted um, that, you know, the coverage in the lighting companies of this kind of IoT effort has been, I mean, it's not been small. The, the messaging has come in, um, in the annual reports. It's come from senior people in the organization. So I think you, you have the benefit of uh, alignment and uh, board level mindshare, which often with these kind of new technical things, it's, it's kind of buried and doesn't really get the, the senior right. management visibility. So congratulations. Well, Greg, I really appreciate the chance to talk with you. Thanks for uh, uh, explaining uh, what VLC is and what it can be used for and what Acuity brands are doing. You've made some great investments. I know you've got some good people uh, on, your, on your team. So uh, thanks again and congratulations. Oh, thanks very much. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> what, would you, uh, what would you take with you to Mars? Uh, I, well, I have a pretty eclectic music taste, so it was pretty tough to imagine just three songs. Um, 
but uh, I, I figured I had to, to spread it across different styles. So I think I'd take uh, Take Five by Dave Brubeck. So I'd get classic jazz number that really changed the face of jazz at the time. Um, I'd take Sitting on Top of the World by the Lonesome River Band to give me a good uh, bluegrass, you know, uh, part of my repertoire. Oh, and then I'd have to have some kind of classic rock and roll tune. And I think... Um, of all of the sort of epic songs that I, I used to listen to over and over again when I was younger, it would be uh, Telegraph Road by Dire Straits. Oh, those are great choices, I have to say. I, I don't know whether I should be staying impartial here, but uh, Take 5 is on my list as well, and it is also on... Um, oh, I'm having a, a mental uh, uh, relapse here. Let me just go and tell you who else chose that. Um, um, from Google. Basically, it was our, our Google guests, uh, I can't believe oh, no. blanking out. So Mr. Uh, Physical Web, Scott Jensen uh, of Google also ch chose uh, Take 5. So, yeah, that's great. Well, good. Thanks for sharing that. And 